We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, by the way, if you want to turn there with me. But it wasn't from a man, it wasn't from a preaching team, it was that the word sounded forth from this church. And as you can see from our opening slide, actually, one other thing, is there like a goat in here? I heard something over here earlier. <laughs> Anyways, these are on the back table. And timing is actually pretty cool. Dr. Jeffrey Benjamin coming here. If you look at those posters with the question mark, there's, there's questions in that question mark. It's sort of the things that he'll be addressing. Dr. Benjamin is a scientist, um, very much uh, of the vein of scientists. But as part of that, started studying creation and wanted to learn more about that, why those crazy Christians believe that. And in, in the course of that study, became a Christian, came to believe in creation as a scientist, and has now devoted his life to defending that, being able to have good apologetics about that, and answer questions that not just your friends and family that maybe don't know the Lord may have, but maybe that you have. Or, or it's a great opportunity for all of us to get equipped and to be able to give intelligent responses to questions that the world may have around us. So on the back table, these are here like throughout this season, but there's these little booklets and what they are is the Gospel of John. Okay, and there's a plan of salvation in there. And it just says, what are you doing Sunday? And there's an opportunity on the back for you to just write your church name, time, and location. So real simple way to invite somebody to join you for that. And guess what? If they never show up or you don't see them, they've still got the Word of God in their hands. You know? So I encourage you guys to grab some of those. Thank you to all the men that helped serve for the... Uh, ladies Christmas gathering. Appreciate you, brothers. What am I forgetting? I feel, feel like I'm forgetting something. Anything else? Greg's birthday, we got that. All right. Actually, so let me address this. You see on this slide, our first slide here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, that's where we're going to be this morning, eventually. And the title, Earning the Right to Be Heard. And, and that makes sense, especially in line of where we were last week and the, the whole idea of the gospel sounding forth from the church. And then how do we do that? How do we earn the opportunity to be heard? And last week, Paul gave us some things about what living a consistent life looked like and that it was because of the way they lived their life that their words mattered. But the more time I spent in this passage this week, and as the week went on, I, I had another title, and it's this, First Thessalonians chapter 2, what about when things go wrong? And, and I want to clarify that a little bit, okay, a couple of qualifiers as we do that. The first being that, what about when things go wrong, when you're doing everything right, meaning you're not in rebellion against God? Um, obviously, if you're engaged in ongoing sin, the wages of sin is death, so you should expect things to go very wrong. But if you're in a right relationship with the Lord and seeking to please Him with your life, not perfect in practice, right, but your heart is right before the Lord, and things go wrong. Second, you're seeking to do His will and not your own, not just things that you want. So you're not... Um, trying to win your fantasy football league just so you can rub it in those schmucks' faces that you work with. Um, or, you know, you think that you're supposed to marry the, the prettiest girl in the church, but she's already married and has three kids and a restraining order against you. That's <laughs> not what I'm talking about. But what about when you're doing things the right way and things still go wrong? When you're trying to live a life that honors God, and you're seeking to do His will and serve Him in a way that would give Him glory and it doesn't end up looking like you think it should, then what? Will you pray with me? Father, these are questions that I've struggled with this week, uh, going through this passage. And 
Lord, you're faithful and true, and your word is living and powerful. But Lord, we, we live in a world that's a mess, and uh, we, we seek your wisdom, your counsel. So Lord, this word that was inspired by your Holy Spirit, would you illuminate it for us? Bring it to life and the reality of our lives, Lord, through your Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I began last week trying to give you a little bit of context to the book of 1 Thessalonians, which we typically do as we start a new book. And I told you that the story that Joe Bailey shared with us about Paul and Silas being in jail just before Paul came to Thessalonica, that both Joe and I talked about um, the people that were also there in that jail, being able to see that their faith was real when it really mattered, when they were under pressure. And the idea was crushing pressure. You know, they had just been through some stuff, and then they're in jail, and the guys around them saw that their faith mattered, or their faith was real when it really mattered. But I want to go back a little bit further, if you'll have mercy on your pastor, to kind of create a, a bigger picture that I think will give us more application to our passage this morning. So going way back, Paul the Apostle was Saul of Tarsus, right? Most of you guys, I think, know that. A highly educated religious leader in Judaism. When Jesus came and people started saying that Jesus was the promised Messiah that we read about throughout this book, Paul did everything that he could to shut them up. He threatened them. He started rounding them up. He incarcerated them for blasphemy. Long story short, you can read about all that in the book of Acts, but Saul of Tarsus has this life-changing, radical encounter with the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. And I say radical encounter. Radical means something that's um, greatly unusual. But the more I read this book, we all should have a Damascus Road experience in our lives that's just as radical. That we once were this and now everything about us has changed. Certainly, that's what happened with Saul of Tarsus. His name even changed. And he becomes an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as, as we look at Paul's life, if there was anyone that we could ever say that they were all in, for Jesus, I think he would qualify. Paul becomes a missionary after that, where he travels around and he begins to, to plant churches and he's telling everyone about Jesus. And he's got a partner in ministry, right? Anyone remember his partner's name? Timothy was one of them. He was a, a younger pastor that came to the Lord through his ministry, but Barnabas, right? Side by side, arm in arm, partners. And, and they go around and they plant churches, and Paul and Barnabas strengthen these churches. They educate them. They establish elders in each of the churches. And, and even though they're doing all these great things, things don't go perfectly. Even on their, their first missionary journey, remember Paul um, gets stoned almost to death. Threats are made against him, but people are getting saved, and people are following Jesus. Fast forward through a whole bunch of other stuff, and the church is growing, and now Paul's got other guys. You know, some of the guys that came out of these churches coming alongside them, and his ministry team is growing, and things are looking up. We read in Acts chapter 15, verse 36, it says, Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we've preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. So at first they go out into these areas that don't know the Lord, haven't been exposed to Jesus, and they begin sharing. And Paul goes into the temples and reasons with them, gives them good reasons to believe and all that, and really is like tilling soil and doing hard work. And now Paul says, Barnabas, let's go back and kind of take in some fruit and encourage these guys and strengthen them and see what's going on. I'm going to ask you to do something, and I know it's... it's hard for us to do, but I want to ask you to really try to put yourself in Paul's shoes and imagine what his heart was like this day when he said this to Barnabas, what his thoughts were, what his expectations might be 
of how this trip was going to go, how we might have visualized things being, what his expectations would have been. I mean, he surrendered his life completely to Jesus. And he sacrificed to serve Jesus. And he's traveled in areas where people opposed him, often at his own expense. And now he just wants to go do a wellness check and minister to these people and see some of the fruit that the Lord has done and produced through them. So you're in Paul's shoes. What would your expectations be? How do you think things should go? You're all in serving the Lord. And maybe for the first time in your life, you're actually all in. And you have some expectations on what things should look like. Fast forward a little bit more, and it's time to leave. It's time to go on this journey. And Paul and his partner in ministry get in a fight. A disagreement about who should travel with them and who shouldn't. And these godly men can't work it out. The, the contention is so great that they actually separate. And they go their separate ways. How does that make any sense? That there's this contention so great among Christian men that want to serve the Lord and want to tell others about Jesus and, and go visit these churches. And we know later the Lord uses it and he doubled the missionary effort, but what are you thinking if you're in Paul's shoes? What are you thinking if you're in Barnabas' place? So this missionary trip, the second missionary trip, begins with contention that leads to division. And then Paul gets on with the work of the Lord and that work brings difficulty. It's not easy. I don't know what your expectations would be. I don't know what your expectations are here as you serve. And we've, we've shared a lot about how critical every single one of us is and how you bring something, a gift from the Lord or, or something that I will never, ever have. And to make us complete as a church that we can sound out, sound forth to our community, we all got to be playing a part. And, and, and now you're in. And you want to be in. Not guilt or compulsion, but love and gratitude to the Lord you want to serve. And, and what should that look like? It, in my rational mind, as I consider that, I'm, maybe I'm more fleshly than you guys, but it seems like the Lord's work should bring the Lord's favor. I, I mean, if you're, if you're going out to do your own thing or draw attention to yourself, I, I get that. But this, who we're reading about, is the Apostle Paul, who over and over and over again has shown that he wants the Lord's will at any cost. And to start, he and this other brother, who he knows loves Jesus, see things very differently. So Paul takes off to strengthen the churches, and, and they did. And numbers grew, and people were being saved, so they, they decided to go to Asia. But the Bible says that they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Probably not expecting that. Probably not expecting the hindrance to be the Holy Spirit, not letting them go preach the word of God. Um probably not the way they thought things should go. So what did, what do you do? What did they do? They just kept trying to please the Lord. Acts 16 tells us that then they go on and they try to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. And I'm guessing that's probably not what Paul was expecting. If it was, he never would have tried to go, right? It says that they actually tried to go. And the Spirit wouldn't let them. This part of the Bible actually gives me some solace or, or comfort because as much as I desperately seek the Lord and want to do th 
the right things the right way and please him with my service, things don't always work out the way that I thought they would or the way that I think they should. And sometimes things go very, very wrong. And I can get discouraged or quit or I can keep seeking to please God. Wanting to please God, Paul continues to seek God in that when things don't go the way that he thought they should go. And, and he has a vision in the night, if you remember this. And his vision is a man of Mace, uh, Macedonia appears to him and basically says, hey, come on over here and help us. Have you ever thought about if that happened to you in the night? If you had a vision and somebody appeared and says, hey, come over here and help, what your expectations might be? Even if you're getting a little gun shy, like Paul might have been at this point, starting to doubt yourself because it doesn't look like it's supposed to look. I'm guessing he expected to find a man in Macedonia that he could share the gospel with. Or at the very least, help in some way. Right? You have a vision and, and a guy says, hey, come over here and help us, that there's going to be somebody in need of help. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Yeah? With me? We need to start over? Okay, you're with me now. I, I'm actually not guessing about that because the Bible tells us that Paul immediately sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called them to preach the gospel to them. Reasonable conclusion after having that vision. So they take off and they go to the most prominent city in that area, which is Philippi. And there's no temple there. There's not enough Jews that gather for worship, so there's no temple. So Paul goes down to the river where people gather to pray, and he finds some ladies there. No guy looking for help, but he finds some ladies there. One of them's named Lydia. She becomes a Christian, and if you read on, they actually have this really strange encounter with this woman that's possessed by an evil spirit. Apparently, she's given the the power to tell the future, and uh, the men in the community abuse her and exploit her and profit from her. But she won't stop following Paul and Silas around and saying and shouting, these are men of God, and they're speaking forth the way of salvation. Wouldn't stop constantly. Paul commands this demon to leave her, and, and now she's no longer making money for these guys. And and they attack Paul and Silas. And they beat them with rods. And these aren't Jewish guys restricted by Jewish law to, to 39 lashings. I'm guessing they beat them nearly to death. And then we pick up the story where Joe and I started in the last couple of weeks of them being in jail. They beat them and they incarcerate them. Paul loves Jesus. And he's serving Jesus. But things go really wrong. What do you do when things go really, really wrong? Keep trying to please God. But let me ask you this. I mean, just reality. You get beaten and you're thrown in jail. I mean, Paul had all these ideas. He was going to go out and visit these churches and, and I'm sure was looking forward to having contact with individuals and encouraging them. And now he's in jail. Can you, can you please God when you're in jail? Or can you please God when things don't turn out like they were supposed to? Or in your mind were supposed to? I think so. I mean, when you, if you pick up the story there, I think it's Acts chapter 16, they're singing hymns at midnight in the jail. You know, and those around him are like, these guys are either crazy or this is real in their lives. And then an earthquake happens, remember? And the doors open up and they stay because they know if they, they escape, the, the jailer will be put to death. And the other guys watching them also stay. The real banditos or, or criminals or whatever. They could be free, but they stay because of the witness of Paul and Silas being real. I, I told you about that part last week. Joe told us about it the week before. But that jailer must have been in shock when he showed up and they were there. 
And they share Jesus with him. And he gets saved. You think they earned the right to be heard? Certainly did with that guy. He gets saved. His whole family gets saved. And then after that, the Bible says that then he washed their wounds. You ever thought about that? How bad were they wounded? Guys, how bad would you have to be wounded that you'd let another man wash your wounds? I'm not trying to be goofy, but I mean, I, how many of us would be like, no, I'm, I'm good, just give me the water basin and a cloth or something? Some of you guys have been in car wrecks. Some of you guys have had tragic things happen, and you know that a day or two after that, it's not better, it's worse. And that's where we are on the timeline. Paul's got his partner in ministry, and they're going to go out and do these awesome things. And not just one or two things, but everything goes wrong. And not to be gross or carry this on too much, but what were those wounds like? Were they infected at this point? They were beaten, thrown in jail, and, and this stuff happens, and their wounds aren't even washed until later. They didn't get beaten with rods, put in an ambulance, taken a walk-in care, and cleaned up, stitched up, antibiotics. I mean, that's the context that we're in today. That's what you would think, something happens, but that wasn't their reality back then. No pain meds, no stitches. So keep fast forwarding the story. It's not where we're supposed to be. Magistrates hear about this and they authorize their release. Paul says, uh-uh. I'm, I'm a Roman citizen. I'm not going anywhere. You guys held us captive. You couldn't incarcerate a Roman citizen without having a proper trial and a conviction. You couldn't even bind one. If you did, it was a capital offense. So the magistrates actually come down and they, they beg them to leave. And they do. And then they show up in Thessalonica. And what did that look like? I mean, where they couldn't wash their own wounds and it, it appears it's just they leave and they travel and they show up to share with these folks about Jesus. Are these guys sincere? Wow, their life sure looks like it. But now they're back on track. All right, they had this huge obstacle, roadblocks, trials, whatever you want to call it, whatever language it is in your life. But now they're back on track. They're busy about the Lord's work, ready to do the Lord's work. I wonder how they thought that was going to go. Days after a beating. Again, you know, probably worse than even the day that they incurred it. And they begin to share the gospel with these folks for three Sabbath days. Right? Three weekends. And then those that oppose them come after them and actually run them out of town. That's probably not what Paul thought was going to happen. And he goes on to, to Berea, right? Ends up in Berea. That's the place where they, they don't just receive every wind of doctrine that gets thrown at them, every deceiver that comes along, but they actually look and examine what's been said to see if it matches up with the scriptures. So what a, what a cool place to be for a minister, for a missionary, for a, for a pastor. But those that opposed him followed him there. Probably not what he thought was going to happen. And they're so ven venomous. The guys that were supporting Paul were like, you, you can't just go on to the next town. You've got to get ahead of these guys. We've got to put you on a boat and get you out of here. And, and Paul ends up in Corinth and Timothy comes and gives him this report of this church and then takes us to where we are here. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. 
It says, for you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you is not in vain. I'm not sure if after going through everything that I just talked about and I show up to, to share the gospel with these people and my ministry is limited to three weekends, if I would think, well, it, it wasn't for nothing. It wasn't in vain. I mean, Corinth, where he's writing this from, he, he stayed with those folks for like a year and a half. He got to teach and instruct and train them. But he says, you guys know that what we did there mattered. Our coming to you was not in vain. It didn't look like we thought it would look like. It didn't go how we thought it would go, but it was not in vain. You ever felt like something you said to somebody or family maybe that you tried to minister or share the gospel with or why you believe what you believe, that it was in vain? There's a, there's a verse in Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 11. This says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. But it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Notice there's nothing in that verse that says ministry will be easy. Proclaiming forth the gospel like this church did. Nothing in there that says it will be easy or even seem like it's going well. Or that it will go the way that you think it should go or prosper in the thing that you think it should prosper in. There's no promise that you'll get to see a harvest. The fruit of the seed that you're planting or or that you're watering maybe as you share the word of God with others. Sometimes you're going to be run out of town like Paul was or discarded from your friend group. Does that mean that it was done in vain? Does that mean that God's not working? That's kind of a tough question, isn't it? You've got no idea what God is doing. That same person that curses you out might be up, up all night replaying those words that you shared with them or seeing you over and over again living out your faith when it matters, replaying that scenario, and they're just shocked at how you responded or didn't respond when your faith really mattered and they're processing it over and over again. Some of you guys, if you think back, you hung on to a phrase or a verse or something that someone said and they shared it and you couldn't get out of your head. And two o'clock in the morning all by yourself, you confessed to the Lord and asked him to save you. That word or that deed or that verse from a faithful Christian was not in vain. It wasn't shared in vain. Christians, you need to know, like Paul did, that God is working. God's working all the time. He's working even when you can't see it. God is working even when it doesn't look like you think it should look like. God's working when you step out in faith and you begin serving, but you have a disagreement with someone that you're ministering with. Or, or you decide that now you're going to do this or now you're going to do that, but the Spirit of God doesn't let it happen. God's still working. God's still working even when evil opposes you. And there's a roadblock you can't get past. That didn't start with us. It didn't start with, with Paul and these missionary journeys. Think back to the very beginning. Or the very first family. Cain killed his brother Abel. First John something, I think chapter 3, tells us why. Because his works were evil 
and his brothers were righteous. This battle has gone on since the beginning of time. And this, this is a hard one for some of us. God is still working even when he doesn't follow our counsel. Even when his will is different from your will. You guys remember, we went through the book of Job a while back. You remember Job's crazy friends and the counsel that they gave him? And there was a lot of, I think this or I think that. Don't be that type of counselor. Be the type of counselor that's going to say, you know, let me, let me hear what you're saying. Let me consider these things and, and share with you what the Word of God says. But sometimes we're just like Job's counselors when it comes to God. God, you need, you need to do this, and here's what's going on, and, and here's, here's how you should handle that. And he doesn't do it our way. So what do we do then? Paul goes on in verse 2. How far did I say we are going to get in this chapter? <laughs> Paul goes on in verse 2 and he says, But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know. I don't think they knew because Paul came in crying about what had happened. I think they came dragging themselves into town to share with them about Jesus. And it was obvious what happened. We suffered before we came to you and we were spitefully treated in Philippi, Macedonia, where I followed a vision of the Lord to go. But you guys know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. I've actually heard, witnessed a lot of prayer for boldness lately from a lot of you. That's harder for some than it is for others. Dan's out back serving our kids, right? Dan Finnamore, bold? If the President of the United States walked in, do you think Dan would have any problem walking over and saying, hey, I'm Dan Finnamore. Let me tell you about this. Let me tell you about that. But Dan, Dan's also bold in God. Some of us, that's really, really hard. But God can use you in this way. It, it makes it even more magnificent when you faithfully share something. Even when you're not sure how it's going to go. Or it doesn't exactly go like you expected. Paul says, you know... Uh, we were bold in our, in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. Paul said the, the news that we came to share with you guys, it wasn't from us. There was no hidden agenda or deceit. If there was, we would have given up. But as we have been approved by God, to be entrusted with the gospel. Do you guys that are afraid to share your faith ever think of it full circle this way, that this is something that we get to do? So amazing that God revealed himself to us, shared himself with us, that we could receive this unbelievable truth, this, this great news that we can share. Everybody deserves the right to hear, right? To just know, to be exposed to the gospel, the good news. And he says, we've been approved by God. We've been entrusted with this. Even so, we speak not as pleasing men. Oh, we get scared to death about what everybody else thinks. Paul says that that really wasn't our concern. But God, who tests our heart, he validates these things. Verse 5 says, For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak, for covetousness, God is witness. Those of you that are in growth groups, pay attention to verse 5 and 6. Um, for neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. You guys know what that is, right? You have that, and I want it for me. So no hidden agenda. Paul wasn't doing this to get something out of them. Nor, verse 6, nor did we seek glory from men. See that a lot in ministry. 
Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. Paul's saying, we're, we're legit here. God established us as apostles, and with that, we actually have certain rights, certain expectations. We could have demanded your support. We could have demanded certain treatment. And Paul says there was none of that. I love the example that he gives next. He said that we were like a mother and a father to you. Check this out, verse 7. He says, but we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. Is that how you would describe your ministry? Or your witness to those that don't believe? The world, people of a different political party or persuasion than you. Is that how you would describe your ministry? I got a new grandbaby. Did I tell you guys that? <laughs> first, first granddaughter. And this picture means a whole lot more right now. I don't want to describe the process, but think about this. this it's talking about a nursing mother. And other than the, the self-sacrifice of Jesus Christ, is there a better picture of completely giving of yourself? I mean, child, just child development. You ladies, you take like pinky size uh, prenatal vitamins, right? Because that baby has needs and, and all of the nutrients of your body go to that child first. And if you're not providing for that child or, or if you're not providing for yourself, you're going to be depleted. And, and the continuation of this, Paul's saying this... Uh, this child is dependent upon this mother for their very life and she is giving them life and the intimacy of what's going on there, the tenderness of what's going on there says actually giving of ourselves. So let me take it a step further, probably where I shouldn't go, but breastfeeding mom up in the middle of the night weary, tired, giving of herself to that child, what does she expect to get in return? I don't mean an investment 20 years later and you, you provided for your kids, but you're ministering to that child. And what do you expect to get in return? A dirty diaper. Crying, no sleep. Not the response that we would want in ministry, Right? Pour yourself out fully and in response you get a dirty diaper. Sometimes you do. It goes on in verse 9 and says, For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses and God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. Our words came out, but it was our lives that you guys saw that were without fault, without accusation, blameless, he said. We earned the right to be heard among you by the way that we lived, the way that we loved you, the way that we served you. Paul didn't just tell them how to live for Christ. He showed them. He loved them. He served them, and by doing so, again, he earned the opportunity to be heard by them. And then the word of God was received. Check out the picture he gives us of a, of a father in their life. Verse 11, as you know how we exhorted, intensely encouraged. You know, mom comforts, and dad says, okay, you can do it. Get out there and do it. Comforted and charged every one of you. I love that. Every one of you have a role. Go fulfill it. Go do it. Charged them with it. That's a dad. Paul said, we were, we were like both to you, church. 
As the Father does to his own children, verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Paul says you. He calls you. God, God's calling you. Verse 13, he says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men. You weren't, you weren't sitting there saying, am I buying what's coming out of Brian's mouth? But this is the word of God. You welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth. Very little truth in our world today. Paul says you welcomed it and it is the truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Some of you guys are discovering that as you go through this book and you get exposed to this book, this book goes through you and does an effective work. I was sharing with a brother yesterday, I had opportunity to talk with, that 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 was such a significant difference in my life when I started digging into the Word of God daily. Not, not devotionally, I got to do this chapter or that chapter, but just spending time in the Word, whether it was a, a verse or, or three chapters, but daily committing myself to this, like a month into it, not knowing what in the world was happening. But things were changing because it's living and powerful and it was changing me. And Paul says, That's, that was going on with you guys. That's what was happening effectively works in you who believe. Verse 14, for you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God. Again, that principle, follow me as I follow Christ, this was spreading throughout Paul's ministry. Became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, countrymen as they did from the Judeans. What a sales pitch. Be like me. And you will suffer for Jesus. You will be persecuted, Paul's saying. Who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. Now, who wants in? And they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. Now, now don't mistake this. The Jews weren't saying we don't want anyone to come to Jesus. It was just we want you to come through us. Right, you gotta, you got to first become a Jew. And these Christians were saying, no, that's not the case. Jesus is there with open arms. The cross is for you. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Uh, verse 17, but we, brethren, haven't been taken away from you for a short time in presence, but not in heart. We will run out of town, but we want to be with you. We wish that we were with you. We're, we're there in heart. Endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and time again, time and time again, even me, Paul the Apostle, thought it was going to go this way or had the expectation that I was going to get to come see you, but things went wrong. Time and time again, Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? What greater hope and joy is there than that? That you share the gospel, you share the good news with somebody that you never thought would receive. And at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're ready. And they're saved. We had a coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in a sense for one in our church family. Penny's mom went to be with the Lord this weekend in, her, in his presence right now. And even though our hearts grieve, there's joy and there's hope and rejoicing in her being in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, for you, verse 20, for you are our glory and our joy. Guys, one to another, we should be that hope and that joy and that crown of rejoicing in each other's lives. That we would have assurance that our ministering to one another, our ministering in our community, and our, all our communities are different, right? Not just geographically where we live, but where we work and our families. That that ministry is not, is not, is not in vain. 
God is working, even when we can't see it. Paul continues in chapter 3. Don't panic. I'm reading three verses, okay? Where's Joe? In conclusion, I'll close with this. I'm sorry. I'll close with this. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. Appointed to this. Love God, serve God, seek to follow the direction of his will. But sometimes things are going to go wrong. And sometimes things are going to look very different than we think that they should. And like Paul, we need to be faithful to keep pressing forward. If we come up against opposition or a roadblock, we keep pressing forward. We don't stop ministering. Listen, we don't stop ministering where we can be used. Where we are being used. Just because we can't yet do what we think we should be doing. In Romans chapter 5, Paul says, We also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope, hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So we keep pressing forward. And that, that perseverance develops character. And I believe clarifies our identity in Christ. Both for ourselves so that we know that it's not in vain, that our service is not in vain, but also all those around us that are watching. And they see that your faith is real when it matters. That our faith is real when we serve them, sacrifice for them, lay down our lives for the Lord, ministering to them. And the response that we get is sometimes a dirty diaper. Our faith being real is sometimes just like that. So when it looks like God isn't working or things go wrong, just keep pleasing God. And God will receive that offering and those around you may not be shaken by the afflictions. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. I, I thank you for both titles here, both aspects of this passage of earning the right to be heard in other people's lives, Lord, that the way that we live matters. But also, God, that you're God. And you're all knowing and we're not. And we don't always see the things that you're doing. And things don't always look like we think that they should look like. And Lord, help us to be faithful and continue to be used in, in the ways that we can be used and continue to seek to please you and keep pressing forward. Strengthen us, Lord, one to another. Use us in each other's lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.